All right, so this is meant to be a conversation. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, if you heard me joking earlier, there's a whole series of things around like how the matrix math and linear algebra side of the deep technical uh, goes that I'm not smart enough to answer. So if you have those questions, I'm going to defer those to um, Kevin, Scott, and Michael, who head up our AI and ML practice globally. Um, but the intent of this was to kind of address where we're at in the market and then talk about the implementation and usage of some of these tools, the constraints, and make sure that everybody in the room has a good overview of where things are at. Sound good? Awesome. Um, make sure I can go into the clips here. There we go. Maybe. All right. And we'll have to do this manual. There we go. So this is just about everything you need to know about me. Unfortunately, it tells you none about why you should care about my opinion in this space. So let me give you that piece. So I wrote software professionally for about 30 years. 20 of that was in the data and AI space. Um, long before it was data and AI, it was heuristics and large data systems. First system I worked on in my professional life in that space was 1.8 billion messages per day. And that was in the late 90s. Um, and so you get into these kind of large stream of data, sliding window problems, analytics to exception detection and all that fun. So that's where every book I've ever written is in. Uh, that's where all the patents I hold are. Uh, for my role at Improving, I head up our consulting arm globally. So I'm our chief consulting officer. Um, I'm responsible for client delivery, go to market, and employee growth. And so I spend a lot of my time looking at where the future is taking us and then how to prepare our teams to go forward. And then I do a lot of sessions like this for our clients. So. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, we've got to talk about what AI is because there's not really a good <laughs> industry definition. I'm not going to go into the esoteric evaluation of this. Um, we're simply going to say it's a simulation of human capacity. There are seven different types of human intelligence. That's not a computer science thing. That's a, a cognitive neuroscience thing. We have basically seven different types of intelligence as humans, right? From spatial to visual to interpersonal to intrapersonal to linguistics to logic and mathematics. We simulate those capacities and that simulation is AI. Okay? So we'll get way deep in the weeds if we talk about the difference of what math is just heuristics versus what is AI. So we're going to keep it super high level and say it's a simulation of human capacity. Now that simulation of human capacity, um, ultimately we typically think about Skynet. Um, we think about the kind of AGI and those kind of things. It's not this. We're nowhere close to this. And when you talk to the best researchers in the field, this won't happen in our lifetime. This won't happen in my kid's lifetime. We don't have the processing power, we don't have the data, and we don't have the mathematics to do it. Now, all of that could change tomorrow, but it's unlikely. Now, I'm going to ask you to set aside the, the fear of AGI for portion of this. But there is also the, it's kind of naive, it's kind of stupid, but it's still also useful if we use it for what it's built for. Right? Uh, we're going to talk about GitHub Copilot, we're going to talk about coding assistance tools and those kind of things. They are very good for what they're intended for. What they're intended to do is not, however, to replace a developer. They're intended to be a co-pilot. That's why they're named co-pilot. Is to be there to assist you with mundane things and speed you up. <clears throat> That's it. Make sense? Any questions before we go on past this? <clears throat> Fantastic. So let's go into kind of an overarching mental model, please. Um, so in that definition of AI, all AI solutions use the top pattern, in which we take <clears throat> rules, however they've been written, and we take data, and it makes a prediction. It makes an answer, right? Show me these rules and tell me whether the car's going to crash. Take these rules and this video stream or this picture and tell me whether that mole is cancerous. They're all applying a set of rules to give a prediction. And then we use the confidence interval or the percentage likelihood of that answer being right and we go, anything above 85% is good. Or ChatGPT says anything above 70% is good, right? Now, where you set that percentage is entirely up to you as the developer. But that's how that whole system works, regardless of the math and the systems behind it. 
The only thing that has changed in the last 70 years is how we write the rules. That's it. Now, the original systems, right, for this were called expert systems, where an expert would actually learn to write the rules, and this gave us LISA, this gave us um, grammar check in the early versions of like Lotus and WordPerfect and the, the Microsoft Works uh, toolkit, for anybody old enough to remember any of those. Um, those were all written by humans. Now, the big problem was to write enough rules for it to be sufficiently valuable took a ton of effort. It took thousands of developers writing those rules. So what we started to do was come up with new math to write new rules. They could statistically model out the data and the answers and infer the rules faster than humans could write them. And so that's where we're at today is we're using machines, using machine learning and deep learning to write the rules. Make sense? When you hear rules, when you hear algorithm, just think math equations because that's ultimately what they all are. So if we move forward, there's kind of some layers to this in which the rules-based system then turned into decision trees where you'd have long chains of decision structures, and then into decision forests, and then it got us into these neural networks where they could go back and forth and you'd have different weightings based on nodes that kind of simulated the human brain. And that's ultimately what we've gotten. Now the reason we've gotten there is because all language has patterns, whether that's a programming language or a spoken language. So I'm going to ask you guys to help me. We're going to recreate ChatGPT in this room right now. So if I give you this prompt, good blank Bob. Good blank Bob. Without shouting out the answer, somebody raise your hand. Give me the word you're going to fill in. Morning. Morning. All right, show of hands. Who had morning? Awesome. Give me another word. Effort. Good effort. Awesome. Who had effort? Show of hands. <coughs> Give me another word. Job. 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 Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Show of hands. Who had job? Five. Fantastic. Now, what ChatGPT does is just this. It reads a ton of sentences. We're talking about petabytes of sentences. And then it extracts the statistically most likely combination of words. And it creates a cloud of those words, and it weights them how closely related they are. And then it goes, hey, in the top 30% of results, randomly choose. That's it. That's why it gives you new answers every time, is it's randomly choosing from the top 30% of the statistically most likely answer. <clears throat> right? Now, if I, and the reason this functions is because language has patterns, we call it grammar, right? or in programming languages, we call it syntax. If I ask for the next three words, good morning, Bob, blank, 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 what is it? How are you? How, how are you? Every time, everybody goes, how are you? Because it's polite, because it's a common trope. If you're coding in C-sharp and you're going to end a statement and move to the next line, what do you do? Semicolon, period. And if you're going to write a method signature and you're going to create parameters, where do they go? in between the parentheses. These patterns allow us to simulate an understanding of linguistics, simulate an understanding of the programming language, because the patterns are consistent. It does not understand the pattern, and that's the key thing to understand. It doesn't know that Bob exists. It doesn't know what time of day it is. It simply knows these are the most likely words that come <clears throat> close to words like you gave me. The same is true for GitHub Copilot or Azure Code, uh, Amazon Code Whisperer or Star Coder or there's a dozen large language models for code generation out there now. They do not understand the rules of the system. They understand the statistics of the outcomes. Now, where might that be valuable? If I, if I have something that understands language and I need to write a quick email out to somebody, do I have to type the whole email? No, I can go, hey, I need an email greeting them and then asking them about an update on this project and it'll, it'll expand that into here's, here's a good rough draft. In the programming world, where would that be valuable? In the API calls. Huh? API calls. 
where we have standard patterns. We have to do the same thing we've done a dozen other times, and it's just <clears throat> coding against that API. Be like, hey, we've got a new API endpoint. It matches these standards. Go code the implementation. Go write unit tests that verify the, the validity of all these things. Right? Because the pattern is consistent and predictable, it saves us labor. That's the entire <coughs> ballgame for AI in the world today is labor compression. I wish I could tell you it's fancier than that. It's not. It's just about saving hours. Now, for tax purposes, Oxy records all of your hours as an investment in systems development, et cetera. Anybody know what those hours are worth? You have to put in your hours in a time tracking system, yes? Yes. Do you know accounting? How do they attribute those hours? <clears throat> the industry standard is $50, right? Now, if I can save four hours, I've just saved $200, right? That's the entire equation for all AI tooling. That's why Copilot is out there. It's not to write software for you. It's to save hours because you're going to get paid your salary regardless. And so if I can get four times the effectiveness out of those hours, then it's worth more. Make sense? Anybody have less work to do now than you did three years ago? <coughs> no. Is your team bigger than it was three years ago? Mm -hmm. No? Is it bigger by an equivalent amount to the work increase? No. My team is doing more with less than really we ever have in the past because expectations are higher, staffing is lower, <laughs> right? That's kind of the market crazy that we've been in for four years. And so these tools are helping to, to address those things. But ultimately, the judgment, the discernment still has to be human because it doesn't know Bob exists. It doesn't actually know what that API is supposed to do. It just knows here's the pattern that all the other APIs match. Make sense? Awesome. So as we move forward, there's a couple of different pieces to this, and I want to talk about it because we've talked about like how we got here. But I want to talk about the big pieces that are driving innovation in the world because this will give you an idea of where these problems can help address things you're doing today. Because I, I can guarantee you're writing software today, you don't need to be writing. That there are systems and algorithms out there that will make it much easier for you. That is not necessarily using Copilot to write it, but knowing that there are tools out there. So supervised learning is not somebody coming up to me and going, hey, did you file your TPS reports? Did it have a cover sheet, right? That is, we knew the answer before we started, <clears throat> right? What are some answers you know about your code before you start? Bug free. Bug free, okay. It compiles, right? Or it doesn't, you know that answer before you start editing. Right? The test pass or don't. You know that before you can start editing. You know what language it is? You know what language it's in. And so we can take those answers and we can recreate those answers by going, here's all the data, all the code. Here are the answers. Go write code that matches those answers. And it will figure out the rules because we have the answers before we started. Here is this feature, and here's all the code that fulfilled that feature. If we have enough of those, we can teach it to write code for a feature. Now think about your business, right? We know this is what a shut-in on a downhole collision looks like. Here's all the preceding data. <clears throat> Go learn the rules to avoid shut-ins because we knew the answers ahead of time. Now, there are frameworks for this already in existence, whether that's learning for j or ml.net, that's machine learning.net. It's a C sharp interface for a ton of the common machine learning algorithms. So that it can literally plug straight on top of things like Entity Framework or in Hibernate, and you can have linear regressions and uh, anomaly detection out of the box without having to write any additional code leveraging those frameworks. Because it knew the answers, it trained the model, you don't have to do that. Now, reinforcement learning is a lot more like my 10 year old. Um, so, my 10 year old, when I tell him to go clean his room, he goes upstairs, five minutes later, comes downstairs, goes, room's clean, show of hands, who believes him? All right, you were all kids at one point. Awesome. So I go upstairs, and what did he do? Pushed under his bed. Under the bed or in the closet, right? Those are the two answers. So I go up there, open the closet, uh, nobody, come on. 
Ten minutes later, it comes back down. All done. Who believes in this time? You are a very trusting individual. <laughs> My son, however, doesn't deserve it because he absolutely did whatever the opposite of the first one was. If it was under his bed, he put it in the closet. If it was in his closet, he put it under the bed. Now, he will have made some progress. His desk will look good. His bookcase will look good. And so I give him that feedback. Now, through this process of looking at the solution and going, you got this right, you got this wrong, mm -hmm. I then teach him all of the characteristics of a clean room, which is this kind of amorphous idea. That enables him when we go to visit my parents and he's up in the upstairs game room with his cousins. And I go, hey, you made a mess, go clean it. It's not the room he was trained on. And yet he can then go clean that room to our satisfaction because he was trained with reinforcement. Now the same thing happens with computer algorithms. Reinforcement training allows us to go, hey, try and we'll evaluate the criteria typically through like a scoring system. This is where genetic algorithms come in. It's like try, we'll score them, and then the next generation tries again but only tries the best answers. This allows us to do like pharmaceutical research and those kind of things. It also allows us to do predictive analysis for downtime in production systems. Not that that's important to you. Know, so. Right? Because we can go, ah, we tried that before, it created bad outcomes, so don't try that again. And we give it reinforcement. And then unsupervised learning is the place in which we don't know the answer, mm -hmm. we have questions. There are questions that AI will not answer, but it will give us better questions. We did some work with Walmart. And one of the things we were looking at is the sales of things ahead of predictable disasters like hurricanes and blizzards. Now, what do you think sells more ahead of a blizzard or a hurricane than normally would sell? Alcohol. Alcohol? Water. Water? Canned foods. Canned foods, absolutely. Batteries, right? Flashlights, strawberry pop tarts, all the things you would expect. We looked at the data and we're like, with strawberry pop tarts, we screwed something up. We went in and looked at it and noticed right there, mm -hmm. it's four standard deviations above normal. Holy crap. So we start looking into it and we're like, all right, restock all the pop tarts and only the strawberry ones sold. Raise the price on strawberry pop tarts because it's good capitalists. And they don't sell as well. Blueberry pop tarts sold more. Now, before I said that, how many people knew there were blueberry pop tarts? <laughs> I did. Now imagine you're the VP of procurement for Walmart, and you're talking about a head of Hurricane Ike or Katrina mm -hmm. or Harvey. And you're talking about shipping materials to Houston, Louisiana, Florida. You go, hold on, I need four truckloads of strawberry pop tarts. You'd be out of a job by the end of the day. So you'd have been right. Because it turns out it hits a trifecta we couldn't have seen because of the amount of data. We were analyzing sales data down to the 15-second interval for every store in the path of those storms for a decade, for every skew, and combining them by product category. Turns out strawberry Pop-Tarts have the highest sugar content. They're mm -hmm. higher sugar content than great value brand. They're small, they're shelf-stable, kids like them, and they're cheap. Mm -hmm. So most people don't budget for an evacuation. And so it showed us a problem in the business that we couldn't see because of the amount of data density. That's unsupervised learning. Now what it didn't do is give you any recommendations based on that. Now when you walk into a Walmart ahead of a predictable disaster like a hurricane or a blizzard, what is what have they done? There's a pallet of water pallet of batteries, pallet of snacks, right there by the front so you can literally just pick up what you need and, and get in and out quickly, which reduces their labor costs, increases their customer flow, and increases their sales throughput. Their profitability goes up massively. The AI didn't tell them to do that. They looked at the an analytics and went, ooh, we can change this so that people who just need the things that they would come in for most of the time don't have to go through the rest of the story. Make sense? So, classic machine learning is a experimentation in statistics, right? So we take spam filters, we've been doing this for years, uh, grammar checks, we've been doing this for years. We go, hey, it turns out that was a, that was a good letter, that was, that was ham, not spam. That's actually where the term comes from, is ham, not spam. We look 
for keyword density, and we go, oh, most of the time that's a good letter, we'll call it good. Most of the time that's a bad letter, we'll call it bad. What are some keywords that key you off that it is spam? Got them written down right there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Free is one of them. You won. You won, right? Oddly enough, Nigeria shows up in that because of the prevalence of the Nigerian print scam in the 90s. Any number in the trillions or larger? Yeah. And so now we've even expanded it to go, all right, what about the person sending it to you? What about whether they're imitating an additional uh, DFAR or uh, DMAC, DKIM? right, on the infrastructure side? Is it a known sender? Is it a part of your address list? All of this now plays into the statistical model, but it's still a statistical model. And then after the statistical model is a learned model of reinforcement learning where you go, oh, that's not junk, or that is junk. It starts learning your preferences that are outside of those statistical models. So you see the combination of these models. Because most decision making is not simple. It's not a single decision. <clears throat> It is something that you're going to add to multiple times. Now, deep learning breaks apart the problem. We use image detection in this. Breaks apart the problem and goes, hey, I'm going to take this chunk of the image. I'm going to break it into pieces. I'm going to keep reducing those pieces until I can't recognize what it was. And then I'm going to feed that in so that I, I don't have to analyze 45 billion pixels. I can actually reduce this to about a tenth of that before I process it. Right, because turns out we're actually pretty good as humans recognizing a shape with limited to no detail to it, right? <clears throat> what is that? Zebra. 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 Donkey? Absolutely. That's going to be a horse. Now, if I added way more detail and I became like the Salvador Dali of <clears throat> zebra painting, would that change the answer? No. That's what this does. Is it simply removes all the extraneous details that make it look good to determining what it is. Because we deal with a ton of data in our day-to-day that -day, actually is not important to the decision-making. It's just making it look good, making a human feel comfortable with the decision. It might be an ugly zebra. The computer doesn't care. It just cares if it's a zebra. Make sense? And so the code you get out of some of these systems, like generative systems, like Copilot, et cetera, is not pretty. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be functional. It's meant to be the zebra, not the Salvador Dali version. You're going to have to turn it in. The art of computer science is still going to have to be you. This is why I tell people, your job is not at risk for being replaced by AI. Your job is absolutely at risk for being replaced by somebody who knows what you know and uses AI. So, we're as we progress through this, there is... Um, the idea behind this is the complexity of problems it can solve. Ultimately, we're talking about different ways to write the rules. So we can skip the good morning, Bob. Um, now let me put this in historical context. How many people have read something like AI is going to displace X percent of jobs by this year, right? Like 50% of jobs by 2050, 10% of jobs by 2025. Somebody, have you read something like that on LinkedIn? Yeah. Uh, let me tell you about a few times where this kind of story has happened. 1956, Dartmouth College hosted a symposium on human computer intelligence, and they coined the term artificial intelligence at that event. They also came out and said within a decade we'd have a human level computer in every intelligence area. <clears throat> 1956, how are we doing? Almost there. Almost there. Right? Within a decade. In the 70s, they said all manufacturing jobs worldwide. 1974, front page of the Wall Street Journal. All manufacturing jobs will be replaced by AI and robotics in the next 50 years. That's next year. How are we doing? Anybody still doing manufacturing? We're nowhere close. In the 1980s, all clerical work will be replaced by AI in the next two decades. 
Anybody still employ clerical in accounting, back office, legal, courts? We end up in what the, these hype cycles. Uh, and so if we go, I think the next slide is the hype cycle. So this is Gartner's hype cycle. Follows a technology trigger through how it influences the market. Most people believe this is about technology. It is not. It's about money. If I am an inventor at Stanford who cracks a generative pre-trained transformer as an algorithm, but I need tens of billions of dollars to develop that into a working product, what do I go do if I don't have tens of billions of dollars? I go for investors. And what do I give those investors to get their money? Buying the sky dreams. Buying the sky dreams. How do I, like, how do I represent that legally? I give them equity in my company. I give them a piece of it, right? Now, a piece of something that hasn't been built yet is worthless. So I'm actually selling them a promise. I'm selling them a dream. Now, the more money I need, what happens to the size of the promise? Bigger. It's bigger. Until a point in which the promise is unfulfillable and it collapses and the money dries up. At which point, a whole ton of companies go bankrupt. Anybody know how many products in the AI space were launched in 2023 in the United States only? New products. Over 100? Over 6,000. Anybody know how many went bankrupt? Most of them. Over 4,000. Promises were unachievable, largely because they chose the wrong promise. Now, that doesn't mean that it wasn't valuable. They did develop additional new things, right? And that's where we try and figure out the right problems to apply it to. Because there are some problems where writing the software will actually address the problem better, right? A human being writing the code versus using statistical models or Bayesian algorithms or those kinds of things. We have to figure out the right problems to pick when we're talking about some of these tools. Make sense? Awesome. So let's talk about how it changes the way we work. And we're actually going to dive into some of the toolkit. Um, there's a lot of places where this is, is playing out today. When I say today, I mean we are actively working on projects in all of these areas for our customers. Um, so in, I'm going to focus on the IT side. If you have questions on the other, feel free. But like uh, we did a conversion from Cosmos Atlas to, or sorry, from Atlas for MongoDB to Cosmos on Azure. And it turns out that if you use some of Cosmos's features, you can optimize the data retrieval for Mongo APIs. Uh, we did so by using a generative AI to rewrite the API calls to give the same output, but to do it in a better way for cost and reduce $750,000 a week in Azure hosting. Now, a human still had to review them, but how much labor would it take for you to analyze and rewrite every API call at Oxy for the week? Like if you took one week of API calls to every system and had to analyze them and rewrite them, how much labor would that take you? <clears throat> Years of the entire dev team? And so those types of things where you want to do it, it just isn't cost productive to do so. Right? Code documentation is another one. We're like, hey, go insert comments that describes what this code does. Because it can take variable names and method names and extrapolate the business process from those type of answers. Make sense? And then code assistance and generation. This is actually pluggable into almost every system, uh, almost every IDE in the space today. So I'm going to share my screen here. I use Writer um, because I'm a hipster. Um, so let me switch over and share the right screen here. There we go. So this is actually improving internal um, uh, employee portal. This is our code base. Let me zoom in. Sorry for everybody in the room. Want. Let's crank that up to like 22, shall we? 
There we go. Better? Yeah. All right. So in this case, you'll notice we're calling a repository pattern. We're getting some stuff. And here, so I've got GitHub Copilot for business installed, and I'll talk about it in a minute why that's important is the distinction. But I can come here and go check the calendar event for null, or if the registered users contain current user. Now, come on, wake up. I'm still connected to the internet, right? Not a demo until something goes wrong. It's working on it. Is this far enough to take the be the kind of event of the two words? It it should be. <laughs> so ultimately what it's gonna do is it's gonna take this, just like good morning Bob, right? And it's gonna break it apart and then it's gonna take all the code around it and go, is there a variable that represents calendar event? <clears throat> And then what's the likely syntax to check for null and throw an exception? And then it's going to generate a suggested chunk of code. Now to do that, it feeds the contents of this code file to the API. It shifts my IP outside my walls. How many of you have a confidentiality agreement in your employee clause of not giving away in the Oxy's IP? I mean, I have one because we're a vendor for you guys, right? Which is why I didn't use any of your code here. Um, and I have no idea why it's taking so long to return. Um, is it taking the next line, 174? Is it takes the whole body of the file, potentially. It's basically looking at the event as you go above. So it's already looking at the rule of time information. Well, it will regenerate this. It will not know that dark. this is already there. It will know this is context being there. So it will give you duplication. Now, the, the interesting part about this is as you look at um, the structure, if it's shipping, sorry, making sure that my IDE is not locked up. It's spinning down here, which is ultimately, I think, my the fact that I'm tethered to my phone. Um, but ultimately, all code generation systems are taking the context around the instruction you've given it and generating something that matches the pattern. Now, that's valuable for like API implementations, those kind of things, but almost all of them leave your walls. Amazon Code Whisper has an API, leaves your walls. GitHub Copilot, API leaves your walls. Now, this is the difference between, and I highly recommend if you don't already have one, get with somebody and create a policy around using these tools to require a corporate license and data privacy settings. Because GitHub Copilot has a business version where they guarantee it is securely transmitted and never stored on their side, never used to train, which means you're not leaking your IP, right? assuming you trust Microsoft. The other side of it is, how many folks have heard about the class action lawsuits around tools like this? No? Uh, just not using anybody and everybody's training stuff? So they are using yeah. literally all publicly accessible MIT licensed code or Apache or GPL code licensed code in their training model. And so a whole bunch of people have gone, you're using my stuff that's not allowed even though their license technically allows it. And so Microsoft has said, Microsoft specifically, Amazon then followed suit, uh, has said, we will defend you and pay any settlement for a copyright claim against the usage of our AI systems. Great business answer for one reason. They knew they were going to have to settle those lawsuits anyway. So they're getting the customers to pay for the subscription.
subscriptions and then using that revenue to pay the settlements on the lawsuits that they were going to have to have anymore. So if we, if we have a enterprise license, the question we ask is going to store somewhere as a law? So if you do an enterprise license, um, the answer is no. It will send it to the API, it will generate the answer, and then not store the prompt or the generated answer. And so, but if you if you just go out to GitHub right now and you sign up personally for it, and then you wire it into your IDE, which you can do, like you're not guaranteed that privacy. So GitHub Copilot, if you just sign up for it personally, does not tell you they won't hold on to it. They absolutely hold on to it. It's only GitHub Copilot for business, which is the corporate license, that gives you the guarantee of data security. Make sense? Questions so far? So let's talk about where we've gone in the last six months. Um, so chat GPT-4 is massively more productive. And by the way, GitHub Copilot is based on ChatGPT 3. The ChatGPT 4 version of GitHub Copilot is coming out this year. It's massively more successful in almost every measurable way. This is because of complexity. Anybody in here play a musical instrument? What instrument? Trumpet. Trumpet. Fantastic. Piano. Piano. Awesome. You guys are... I swear I didn't plan them. How many keys on a trumpet? Three. Three. How many keys on a piano? Eighty-eight. Which one can play more music? They can both play the same. Yeah, that's not true though. He can play a lot more, uh, more as a pianist, I think. <clears throat> the trumpet. For one reason, a properly tuned piano cannot play an out-of-tune note. Mm, so if me as a musician, I need to play something a little flat to make you a little sad or play it warbly to make you uneasy, I can manipulate your emotions with music, and that's actually how musicians do it, in a way a piano never can. Pianos are complex, so they can play increased complexity. What they can't do is change the difficulty of the music. Humans deal with difficulty incredibly well. We deal with com complexity incredibly poorly, right? Now, we largely combine those when we talk about knowledge work, right? The hardest problems are the ones with all the most moving pieces, typically, because it, it stretches us to deal with complexity. Now, in the machine learning space, we call that parameters, right? We measure the complexity of a system by its parameters. Uh, who's really good at mathematics? I'm not chucking me that marker. Thank you. You should try out for the text. Um, Anybody really good at mathematics? Like linear algebra, matrix factorization, like... Not anymore. <laughs> Not well, matrix matrix. <laughs> Fantastic. Volunteering. Okay. I'm going to write a couple of linear algebra proofs up here, and I'm going to ask you to solve them, and then we're all going to judge you for that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, honorary doctorate from MIT. <laughs> How many things did you have to consider in solving each of these equations? Three things. What three? The first number, the second number, operator. Yep. Operator, operand one, operand two, and the question. So four, right? The equal sign is actually the question. Oh, okay. Right? So four things. That is a four parameter equation by which you can do all basic mathematics. Chat GPT 2 when it came out. How many parameters? Four. Seven million. ChatGPT 3.5 when it came out. How many parameters? Six billion. Thirty-four billion. <clears throat> ChatGPT 4 is estimated at 1.2 trillion. Now, if you're having a hard time picturing that, you're not alone. It is a five-story office building of paper printed double side, just to print the equation. Now, here's the fun part. Every word 
right? When it fills in morning, it just solved that equation. And then it feeds it in again and solves it again. Feeds it in again, solves it again. Every single word is a solve of that equation. <clears throat> Same thing is true for this. It's 34 billion parameters. And so it's contextualizing in an n-dimensional space all the related concepts. That's a miracle chain. Do what? I remember like uh, there's a some of the that uh, for the word generation is basically the base the base of Merkle chain where it just takes a problem pick a previous word and gets it and like the word. Yep. So essentially this is what it is. It just yeah, it's, you're grabbing future. It is Bayesian theory, which is a branch of statistical theory applied in a convolutional <coughs> neural network. Um, and so ultimately you can visualize it as a decision force. Right, where it factors you into an area and then you go down a decision tree to the most likely additional areas. It's just no human could solve that equation that quickly. Right? It would take a team of humans years to solve it once. And that's the computational difference we're talking about in complexity. Now, generative AI has had a significant impact. Now, this is talking about efficacy impact in different areas of generative AI primarily around use cases that are heavy in labor. Um, anybody hear about the New York attorney who got disbarred because he generated <laughs> a case brief and it turns out all the references were made up? Why did he get disbarred? He didn't he check. Proofread. He didn't check it and he has a legal responsibility to check it. Now had he proofread it and corrected the references, he would have done nothing wrong. Anybody hear about the Samsung engineer that got fired? fed Samsung's firmware into ChatGPT, asked it to optimize it, and it served that firmware to one of their competitors. Uh, not joking. Because data privacy became a huge part of this conversation, and it needs to be a part of your conversation as you approach how you leverage these tools, is how you make sure you're using them data private. But you can also adjust these to things where the level of effort is nearly in infinite. To accomplish something. Now, I'm going to focus in on one of these, which is the office support one. So we built a tool at Improving to try and solve some of this for us. Now, the reason I bring this up is it gets you looking at the right kinds of problems, right? So if I come over here and one of the problems we have is when we bring in new people, either through acquisition or hiring or something like that, they have a hard time understanding all the things improving does because we're fairly large at this point. Bandwidth. Bandwidth. Are you saying my phone? Yeah, there is. All right. And so what we created was a AI interface that scans all of our cloud project data all of our project proposals, all of our case studies, and because this can make up answers, we did what's called factually grounding, which means it, it's not allowed to make up an answer. It has to be able to cite its own references. It can't just generate made up things like the New York attorney, and it's also all data privates. And so this goes, yeah, we do a bunch of these things and here's the documents behind it. You mind clicking on one of those? And it embeds. Now, here's the fun part. Does Oxy have coding standards? How does a new developer at Oxy learn those coding standards? Word of mouth. Are they in SharePoint somewhere? Uh, yeah, sure. All right, I'll look at it. <laughs> All right, no judgment, nobody's getting fired. Raise your hand if you've read all of them and remember them. This is the efficacy problem. The more and more data we have, the harder it is for humans to consume and regurgitate it at will when we need to. And so things like, hey, here's all of our coding standards. On every check-in, go rewrite the code to match our standards without changing its behavior is a prompt that you can inject into your CID, CD pipeline. Right? hey, go scan all of this and look for open source code that's been copy pasted so we don't have a copyright issue. Like there are tools that do that today.
go scan for known vulnerabilities based on this vulnerability database and rewrite it to resolve the vulnerability for security scanning. These are all things that we had pieces of it. We had the scan, but we didn't have the and go rewrite, which is the part that a generative AI added to the equation. Make sense? We had all these documents. They were all in SharePoint. They were like our coding standards, and nobody ever read them. They called me. I went, hey, Devlin, have we ever done X? And I went, yes, it's in SharePoint, which I learned was the worst possible answer to give anybody. <laughs> um, and so what I advise you to do is <clears throat> approach it as a wingman. Now, has anybody ever seen this photo? I used to tell you my favorite and scariest story of the day. So that is an actual plane sitting in lock, uh, sitting at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. Now, I'm not sharing state secrets. This photo is from the DOD press release. This is a fully autonomous aerial vehicle. It is not a drone. There is no human in control of it, and it has its own weapon systems. It has full control of when to use those weapon systems. It was tested for three years in the Australian Air Force, and now the U.S. Air Force is testing <clears throat> It's called the Loyal Wingman Program. It cannot fly without a lead plane. Anybody seen Top Gun Maverick? Right? They're always like, break right, breaking right, right? They never go left. Has anybody noticed this? Sorry, side tangent, but they never go left and it bothers me. The, you never leave your wingman, right? The lead pilot makes almost every strategic decision. They analyze the battlefield. They decide where and how to go approach the problem. The wingman's job is very simple. Protect the lead pilot, protect yourself, <coughs> achieve the mission objectives. That's it. So you take an unbounded problem space, and it becomes a bounded problem space. Now, a whole bunch of other companies attempted to create an automated pilot. But they were trying to replace the lead pilot and failed miserably. Boeing succeeded by not trying to replace the human, but to augment them. The reason I bring this up is this is the way AI is going for us for the next decade. It is going to be the augmentation of you. Make sense? You may take notes, like note taker, like in meetings, whatnot. Yes? Do you actually refer back to them? Not really. Sometimes, maybe. I took 15 years of notes, and I filed them on a bookshelf, and I never really looked at them again. So recently, I took this idea of AI as an augment to me, and I created a second brain. I paid a service to digitize all of them, transcribe them, and send them back to me as text. And then I loaded them into a note system, and I put an AI like this one on top of it. So I can ask myself questions. Like, hey, what did I talk about in that meeting in 2013 at Stuart Title? And it will tell me. Hey, who was in that meeting in 2011? And it will tell me. When's the last time I talked to so-and-so? And it will tell me. It doesn't reach out to them. It doesn't do sales or any of that. It simply <coughs> makes me more effective in recalling those details because that is a complexity problem. It's not a difficulty problem, right? What are the downstream systems that rely on this API that we would need to test for regression for this new version? It's a complexity problem. But if it understands your architectural integrations by feeding it all your API logs, you don't have to feed it your understanding. You can just go, here are all the calls, and it will correlate them and go, here's the downstream change from this entry point to this exit point or these exit points just based on server logs, web logs, these kind of things. Make sense? <clears throat> so I feel like I've been talking an awful lot. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys to talk a little bit. So um, there's all sorts of fun things. Um, where do you spend the majority of your time? In your day-to-day. Where's the majority of your time? In a computer. Doing what? All sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Coding, chatting, Googling. Yep. 
statistically speaking, an average developer spends eight minutes reading code for every one minute writing code. Have you ever jumped into code and not understood what it did? Lord knows I've done that. I've even then edited it without understanding what it did. <laughs> Always works out well. What if I could just go, hey, summarize this. Explain to me what this algorithm is attempting to do. Right? Those kinds of things. Anybody get emails where you get requirements changes via email? They're not in JIRA. They're not in Azure DevOps. They're not <clears> in <throat> whatever tool you use. They're just in email somewhere. And then you have to refer back to them and figure out why at some point. So I have a plugin in my email that reads every email and generates a response for me based on all my previous responses so that I spend less time checking email and replying. Looking at the areas of your life, your work life, and by the way, personal life is great. I send notes to my kids and my wife on a regular basis now that are so heartfelt, and I mean it. I just didn't have to write it. <laughs> Idea. But I am better at those jobs because the thing I wanted to do that would have just taken too much time now takes less time, right? I know nobody in this room does, but anybody ever pushed to like a, a change without like fully testing and security testing and scanning and all that? Like, never happens, right? But so, you know somebody who did, right? What if every check-in got a full vulnerability sweep? Your security team would probably be very happy with you, right? What if every production release looked at optimization of bandwidth and memory utilization so you didn't have performance problems? You can quite literally go, hey, rewrite this code to be more performant, and it will give you a more performant version to review. It's what we did with the Anheuser-Busch example earlier of the $750,000 a week in hosting costs. That was all API costs from around the world just rewriting the API calls and submitting pull requests back to the teams. So you spend a lot of time in emails and anybody spend a lot of time in meetings? Yeah. What are most of the meetings about? Is it the work that you're doing? The work you are going to be doing in the future? Or things that went wrong of the work in the past? All the work. How do you capture those outcomes, those notes, those details? We built a system for us because one of our big problems is capturing client stories, where we interview the team that worked on the project for about 15 minutes, and we generate the four-page documentation of what all they did and the outcomes into a case study. What if you took the meeting transcriptions that are by default, you can do that in Teams. And when turn these into nodes, put them in Confluence or whatever wiki system you use for knowledge base, and then tie them to all the work items that are talked about in the meeting. It's called reasonable compression. It's something that generative AI is very, very good at. But it saves time. Right? One of the other things that we've done for us internally is look at the features we're about to work on for the internal tools and if they are similar to high risk features those are features that ran way over budget previously highlight it and recommend actions to reduce the risk because it's pattern matching it's statistical matching we are optimistic by default as improvers and so you get into this well this one's different because it's actually not different. We can predict when we're likely to fail and put in remediation ahead of time before we ever start working on the feature. So as you guys look at it, this and approach this, as I understand it, you're kind of looking at where you start leveraging AI and ML in your day-to-day. -day. Data privacy is a huge part of it. Make sure that you actually start reading the user license agreements for the tools you're using. I know it sucks. By the way, you can have a chat GPT-like tool analyze the agreements and then give you data like, hey, are they going to use my stuff? Um, it's fantastic. So I use AI to police AI. Um, 
look at the places where you spend the majority of your time and ways to optimize it. It's not going to replace it, but it might optimize it. Of like, oh, I'm going into this new code base, or we're converting from Azure to AWS. We're converting from on-prem to AWS. These on-prem servers, what would be the right AWS infrastructure for running them? And it's going to give you the statistically most likely AWS infrastructure, and you can create a basic project plan very quickly. We do the same thing, that chatbot echo that I showed you. We go, hey, create a project plan for a project based on these things with this infrastructure, and it, here's your template, and it goes, here's improving standard approach to these things. <coughs> so we don't spend days and weeks recreating the wheel every time. Any questions? You guys are awful quiet. <laughs> Just wish the devil were. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> well, let's see if we can pull that out. Can you use it? use it? Can you push it? Yes. Yeah. Um, based off um, all the um, tools you have to be using, um, those large and big models, yep. you know that those models are mainly um, like the Weakness in hallucinations, like how mm -hmm. did you tackle those? So the weakness of all generative AI is the, the ability to hallucinate, the ability to lie. And so there's three different ways that you can approach this. Uh, one is called RAG, retrieval and generate, which is what we did for Echo, where it does a uh, what's called cognitive search or an enhanced leucine index search. Um, you can use Kendra on AWS. You can use cognitive search on Azure. Google, uh, um, so all of them have this version of intelligent search, which is a vectorized search. Basically, it takes your question, searches the documentation first for what would most apply to your question, and then only uses that to generate the answer so that it can't make up new things. And so the rags typically are, are um, where you start. There's what's called factual grounding. Now, factual grounding is a step beyond that in which you go, Here's the question. Here's what was generated. I want you to measure its accuracy against known true things, right? Um, now, typically, this is when you don't have like a, a searchable index of all documentation, those kind of things. Like, this is a, a performance improvement plan for a person. Go check it against the legal structures to make sure it's in line with them. That would be factual ground, right? And then you have what's called forward looking augmented retrieval or flare architectures. If I'm predicting the future and I'm worried about it kind of going down a rabbit hole, I actually evaluate the future <clears throat> that it predicted against all the past to make sure that it's not statistically significant in its deviation from that. And so in all of these cases, you're constraining the ability of the model to be creative at certain extents. The other side is if you want a truly only the number one answer, you can actually turn what's called temperature on a generative AI down to zero, at which point the same answer will be given for the same prompt every time, period, because it takes that 30% and goes only the top answer ever. So you get rid of all creativity, but you get, here's the answer. Still working on it. The piece down in the bottom where it says re retrieving completions is actually <laughs> waiting on Google or uh, uh, GitHub's API to send it back. Now, the reason for this is it's actually sending it this whole class, generating an answer, and then kicking it all back to me and then parsing it on this side. And so it's a little bandwidth heavy. And um, I forgot to ask for Octi guest access. And so I've been tethered to my phone this whole time. Doing that while sharing my screen is mad at me. Um, I find the internet's pretty bad when I'm on my phone up here anyway, so. Yeah, I got one bar, I think. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's just there on a blank screen yeah. forever, so. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're, you're probably running into that. So. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. It's working on. Yes, sir. 
I have, a, I have a question I'm afraid to ask because I don't know much, uh, as much as most people in here about this stuff. Uh, earlier there was a, a, a slide that showed like a, like a chart and you know how it's being used in the healthcare mm -hmm. profession. And um, I've, I've attended a few, uh, a few talks about the uh, digital twin. Mm -hmm. That uh, they're using AI to create a digital point of view to help diagnose <coughs> problems with and stuff like that. What I'm getting at is, one thing was the privacy that you mentioned, and where where do you draw the line, or who determines what line is drawn between, you know, AI gener uh, generated results versus you know, hey look, you know, I rather I rather have a doctor say, hey man, you're you're screwed up versus a, you know AI saying, yeah, you're really screwed up. And there has to be some type of check and balance it or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, do you want to completely depend on, you know, AI or something like that? And like I'm saying, there has to be some type of line drawn. There does. Uh, I'm going to give everybody's favorite answer of the day. Uh, lawyers, insurance companies, and politicians are drawing that line today. <laughs> you know, if that terrifies you, it should. Um, I was about to say the wrong so people. So here's the thing. <clears throat> Self-driving cars are a reality from a technology perspective today. Now, we have three major constraints stopping us. The first is, if the car kills you or kills somebody else, who's, it, who's responsible? Who owns the risk? That's the insurance question, right? Tesla last year killed like 12, 15 people. Now they've settled all of the wrongful death suits to be able to continue producing cars but they also then had to recall their software, right? So we don't have a good answer for who's responsible for the outcomes the AI generates at a legal perspective, right? Then you end up in the, uh, in the healthcare space. We have typically kept AI out of patient outcomes. There is a human responsible for patient outcomes all the time, period, because of malpractice. Right? So a doctor has to sign off on whatever the treatment plan is or the protocol is or the diagnosis is, even if it was generated by AI in the United States, because that doctor then owns the legal culpability. Same reason that the New York attorney got this far. They didn't blame the AI. They went, you can use that tool, but you used it badly, you're at fault. Same thing's going to be true for doctors. Now what we're seeing primarily is optimization of places where there's not human risk. Like billing and medical coding for insurance companies is a pattern recognition problem for here's what we did for the patient and here's how we have to bill it to the insurance. That's pattern matching. So we're using it there heavily, right? And then lastly is the politician side of the regulatory piece of where do we want to protect risk? And you're seeing this become more and more of a thing. Uh, the EU just passed a bunch of restrictions on AI. Um, culturally, we're gonna to have to get okay with it. And right now we're not, right? If I walked in and went, I'm gonna to go to a doctor's office where no human ever interacts with me, but they prescribe me prescriptions. One, that's not legal. And two, most humans wouldn't be okay with it. We wanna to talk to somebody. Now I'm perfectly fine going to a restaurant where there's no human. I'm fine going to a grocery store and not having to interact with a human. But when it comes to my life, my risk, my health, I'm not okay with it. And so what we're seeing is culturally we're drawing some of those lines, politicians are drawing some of those lines, and lawyers and insurance companies are drawing some of them. It's not a great answer. That's where we're at today. So ultimately speaking, you are going to be responsible for the output of every AI you use. They are not magic boxes. They're not infinitely smarter than any of us. They're a statistical model at their core. So they can help, but you still have to own it. Still working on. I will say that um, I got I got GitHub Copilot installed on my IDE, the two ones that I use um, earlier this week, like two things. Yeah. And people just go through their example documentation. Like, hey, do this, and you can expect this auto-completed outcome. I, I can't get them. <laughs> the auto-completed? Or just some of the basic prompts that they have, like yeah. Like what you have here, right yeah. the comments, I was like, hey, generating a message that just takes the two numbers and adds them together, and I couldn't even get that generated. So I don't know. So I have, so not you, I literally have zero problems doing this demo on a good internet connection. So my apologies, should have verified. Um, 
ultimately speaking, typically it's two things. Um, one is properly configuring it into the IDE, which if you're using Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code is a pain in the ass. That's why I use Writer. Um, because Microsoft has a competing code prompt system, right? And so GitHub Copilot doesn't play well in those tools because Microsoft wants you to use theirs. Um, so technically you could turn on Microsoft's and it would work better. Uh, and then the second one is making sure that you don't have a conflicting template system. So I actually had to turn off, I used to have a, a double slash space template in Writer that would pop out a, a range act assert for inside a test. And I had to get rid of it because it would conflict with the template generator. So those were the two bugs I ran into. That probably makes sense. I'm, but, I'm glad I mentioned it because it's probably what's happening. But ultimately, I mean, it's still working on it. It's trying. Um, but yeah, it's, it's decent. It's not going to write full classes for you. You'll have to basically break it down into steps and then comment each step and away it'll go. You can ask it, like, you can give it a, a for loop and then describe the method you want in the middle of the for loop and it'll apply that. Or, hey, for each this collection and do blah, blah, blah. And it's pretty good. It's at least going to save you some typing. Because um, I don't know if, uh, does anybody use a mechanical keyboard? Like, I'm a, I'm a keyboard nut. I actually have a mechanical keyboard in my briefcase. Um, so I renamed Notepad on my PCs to n.exe because I needed to save all the opads. Like, these have limited miles on them. And I want to type as few characters as possible. Um, and so this just lets me type fewer characters. And so I described the problem. Now, ultimately, that means you have to understand it better. I'm a big fan of Martin Fowler when he said that if you can't describe the problem you're working on in two sentences, you don't understand it well enough to write code about it. This forces you to be able to describe the problem in two sentences. And so it becomes a problem construction exercise rather than a typing the code. Yay for demos. Any other questions? I think we've ran slightly over. Uh, yes, that does that never happens to me. <laughs> um, so, if you guys have questions, I will um, share the the slide deck and some of the details along with some further reading and things to get into. I'll also share a copy of our AI policy. Strongly encourage you to start taking a look at that. If you don't have one for Oxy, start looking at one because data privacy and copyright are going to be the biggest conversations in this space for the next two years. Now, once you protect for those, the tools are incredibly powerful, but you have to protect for those. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. There's a future where you have a doctor's office who's advertising. No AI. No AI. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hand online. There we go. When you see that somewhere, remember me. Yep. All right. <laughs> Almost three corner. No way out here. Thank you. Now let's hear the results. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,
for creating a terminal <laughs> out to, to control the airspace. And then we had fighters deployed in that airspace. Very similar idea to you basically have high level reconnaissance, 80,000, 90,000 feet, mm -hmm. and circling a geostat, controlling a 800 mile zone. Yeah, and then and the fear of ours is like, hey, why this is, this is supposed to be stale. Jason, what do we need to do to move this place back to, to zero? <laughs> <laughs> um, can we take these down to the right quick and move them over? Yeah, exactly. That is exactly the typical. It will be gone quickly. Yeah, it'll be taken down to the break room, all in line to the mail, and um, yeah, and then we'll have at it. <laughs> I will be right back. Thanks for the invite. Hopefully that was useful in what you guys were hunting. Um, yeah, yeah, no, very enlightening. Definitely helps with more of the, the AI usage in your perspective. And, uh, There's a ton of competitive offerings right now. Uh, JetBrains has their own coding AI. Microsoft got their own. GitHub's got one, which is Microsoft. Um, and so well, yeah, it was weird when you were saying that Microsoft super is competing with this, but it's competing with itself. <laughs> yeah, like, and this is the chaos of the market right now because we're still in that hype cycle. Uh, everybody's trying to get there. Amazon's Code Whisper trying to get there. Google's got their basically their version of Bard, but for code, mm -hmm. and nobody's there yet. It is helpful, but the average number of usages for a suggested prompt in GitHub Copilot is 30%. So when somebody asks GitHub for a recommendation, only 30% of the time do they actually use the recommendation. And so it's not great yet. It's going to get there, but it's not great yet. Okay. Yeah. 30% actual. You said, like, person yeah. says, oh, I like this song, obviously. Yes. Or, what, what you yeah. yeah. Basically, the way they're evaluating that is when somebody asks GitHub for the for a prompt, does that prompt or something very similar to it end up in the commit? And only 30% of the time is that the case. And so it, it's going to help with efficacy, um, but it's, it's going to help with efficiency. But I don't know that it's going to help massively with efficacy yet. 30% seems not too bad to me. <laughs> it does. I mean, it's, it's a solid increase, but it's not 90%, right? Like, at, at 80, 90%, you start getting into the territory of people will stop looking at its results. At 30%, you're still looking at it and going, maybe it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I can think of a ton of situations where it's just like, no matter what you generate, it was impossible for you to generate what I need to do here. <laughs> but it might give me a great starting point, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things described it like a good place to start. One of the things I found is it's actually better at basic constructs than um, sorry, we can wander that way. Uh, it's better at basic constructs okay, than okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll take that back down so to the lobby and uh, it will recommend things that most computer scientists today don't actually like. Uh, and so, like, it's often not that big. There's a problem. Yeah. 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 Yeah.